What you see here is not the Nikon Z9, but I had the opportunity to check out Nikon's flagship camera on two of my first trips this year. I want to let you know that this video is not sponsored by Nikon. I borrowed this, yeah, the Nikon Z9 that I had from a friend here in Trondheim, and I'll leave you all the information to Christian's Instagram in the description below. First of all, today we're gonna to talk about the Nikon Z9 itself, and then in the combination with the 400 f4.5 that I have in my hands here, uh, the Nikon Z6 on the end is just to bring some points about the body across. I want to start with taking you a bit through my experiences with the Nikon Z9. Then I will sum up what I think about it in total and if it's a buy for me. The first time I got my hands on the Nikon Z9 was for a trip to Dovrefjell to photograph mosk oxen. That was together with Ton Vesby, Aspen Heller and Oddbjörn Ostwick. And if you're interested in seeing that one, it's gonna be up here. Musk oxen in winter are quite often calm animals. They feed around midday and lay most often on the ground to chew up the sparse vegetation they could find. As long as the males do not get into fights, these encounters are very low action. There will be a video coming about all my winter adventures and let's say we will see musk oxen getting at it action-wise. So subscribe to not miss out on that. But back to the situation we are in. The first day for me with holding the Z9 there, looking at resting animals felt a bit oversaturating. I had all this raw power in my hands, but I could not really try it out. There is no need for 20 frames per second in photo for resting animals, nor slow motion video in 4K. That is what I realized when I sat there and recorded animals in super slow motion, 120 FPS and 60 FPS, for no reason other than I had no clue what I was doing with the tool in my hands. On that trip there was not too much action happening also on the other days, but when the animals finally stood up, the camera performed as it was supposed to be. Not only does this camera better than the D6 or whichever DSLR camera Nikon has to offer, but it has the megapixels of the D850 and enough to act like a D500 in crop mode. Whoever is looking for a mirrorless replacement of one of these cameras is not stepping short with the Nikon Z9. But that comes, of course, at a price. I'm used to only 24 megapixels, so 45 megapixels are quite a revelation in wildlife photography. Cropping is a thing we often cannot get around. But when we do not have to do it, that is a lot of pixels. On Nikon Z9 you can simply customize the buttons so that you have an easy switch from full format to crop and I just put that on the joystick so if I press the joystick it just switches forth and back. Your photos become a bit smaller in size and you suddenly get 1.5 times more reach out of your lens. While that works out good enough, I'm always a bit disappointed with the look of crop sensor files. Of course this has to do with grain, light source to sensor size, teleconverter and so on. And that feature, I wouldn't really use it if I didn't really have to. Dovrefjell is a good place to test this though, because often you need it if you did not bring a 600mm lens that weighs as much as a bag of stones. Not really looking at you, Trond. It is advised to stay 200 meters away from mosk oxen, because these animals, instead of running from a threat, are ready to protect themselves. Long lenses are a must, and I brought the 400mm f4.5 with a 1.4 teleconverter. Altogether adding up to 840mm combined with cropping the Z9 sensor. So here is a big reason for potential loss of image quality. But enough of resting musk oxen. Let us talk about action and whether Nikon Z9 is really at home. A few weeks back in February I had the opportunity to go on a weekend trip to photograph golden and white-tailed eagles. On the way there, we stopped at a hotspot for eider ducks. They come in through this fjord channel with the tides and are very trusting with people. It does not happen too often that you think of having a problem with 2.5 meters of focusing distance with musk oxen. This here is a whole different situation. Just got the opportunity to photograph eider ducks for the first time really close up and that with the Nikon Z9. There is so much happening that it's hard to keep an oversight about which animal is spreading its wings or anything else. It's a great experience, uh, but you end up with a ton of photos. I think I have at least 800 in a really short time, which is a lot for me. And uh, yeah, the 
camera performs really nice if you have the video settings set correctly and you film uh, the focus is also not jumping a lot it's really staying on the subject that you yeah kind of focused beforehand and that's really nice I switch forth and back between the Nikkor 400 f4.5 and the 200 to 500 f5.6 while the 400 delivers of course better image quality, the 200 and 500 is a bit more flexible to deliver you some creative opportunities and compositions. The Nikon Z9 performed really well here, bringing home around a thousand photos. You really have to think about memory, because 120 gigabytes seem to be much on a Nikon Z6 with 7 frames per second and 24 megapixels. But you don't feel so safe with a Nikon Z9. But if you already paid the price to get that camera, you do not have to bother much with the price of the CF Express cards. Situations like these with the Eider Ducks and later with the Eagles are much more up to yourself and your experience with the animals. The situation was so new to me that I missed a lot of shots. I'm happy with what I got, but more was possible. So how good you perform here is really up to your speed and how well you know your camera. <laughs> the focus is fast, it picks out subjects with ease, and the many animals served for a really nice interesting chaos and bokeh. The following two days we spent time in a hide for golden eagles in Flatanger, a bit north of Trondheim along the coast. While the first day came with some actions and three golden eagles in front of the height, there was not really any fight or collision between the animals. The second day though came loaded with a bunch of action. Now that I knew the camera a bit better from two days with direct practice and having to have seen golden eagles behave the day before, I had way better chances of getting the photos. I took around 2000 images, eagles fighting, eagles flying, close-up portraits and so on. The camera did not disappoint in photo mode. If there was a situation where it failed or I didn't get the image, it was up to my own mistakes. Like being in video mode and pressing the shutter for photos. One situation while filming slow motion got me really annoyed though. When I have the Nikon Z6 in standby and I press the record button, it wakes out of standby and it starts filming as fast as it can. When I press the record button on the Nikon Z9, ready to film a golden eagle come in, in slow motion, 120 frames per second, 4K, the camera woke up and didn't start recording immediately. You're always careful to press once more, because the camera might start and finish the clip directly. But it took three times of pressing that button until the camera finally started to film. Too late for this landing. Hopefully this can be changed with a setting that I do not know about, but this should not be the case for a camera this fast. What is clear that I would have not gotten some of these photos with the Nikon Z6. Of course the Z9 performs way better, faster and more accurately if you look at some of the fight scenes between eagles. I had great fun testing out this camera. Thank you Christian. So let's shortly sum up the Nikon Z9 before we go over to the lens. 20 frames per second in photo is insane. You can get nearly every situation. It depends on how fast you are because the camera is. You though come home with a lot of photos so you need bigger memory cards. 4K in video, 120 frames per second is a dream come true. That's the feature I'm looking most at in the Nikon Z9. The only problem that I just talked to you about is that the recording somehow didn't start directly when coming out of standby. There are many buttons and many functions. This camera is fully customizable, something that I miss in other Nikon bodies. Of course this takes a bit of time to get used to. Furthermore this is a heavy camera. This is really nice if you have a light lens like the 400 f4.5 when you hold the camera really close to your body, you know. So handheld becomes so easy you nearly don't need a tripod because the main weight is close to your body and stabilized. On the other hand, this reminds me of having an old DSLR camera. I don't want that ever again. It makes nearly this lightweight lens obsolete in a lot of other situations. 
The weight can't be software, of course, so it's a really solid build quality. That's nice, because I think with the Nikon Z9 you could hit a stone and the stone would break before the Nikon Z9. But it is really big, maybe too big for my hands, because I had problems, for example, if I use the FN, the function buttons on the front, and I want to get to the video switch, I don't like where it's positioned, uh, I need way too much movement to get there. Of course, it's something you would get used to, but I think that's just not the right thing for me. In my short time, I enjoyed the greater focusing modes the most and the 3D tracking, of course. In all modes, I have object and animal tracking activated which can help to keep the focus and tracking centered on a specific area. In contrast to the Nikon Z6, where I have all focus modes on the function 1 button, on the Z9 I only had activation for 3D tracking on that button. Because I don't want to waste that button and all the focusing modes work so fine like they are. The function 2 button I use to switch between banks. That's just to have different settings for different light situations, just to have a really fast switch. I didn't have a review button on the front because the Nikon Z9 has a review button on the back, on the right side, so you have it accessible with your right hand. You don't have to take the left hand off the lens. So after all of this, will I get a Nikon Z9? I think the price is okay for what you get, but also for that money, which will set you back, I could do a lot of tours and trips. But especially the weight reminds me of dragging around a DSLR camera. Don't get me wrong, I loved my first Nikon DSLR, the D750, when I got it into my hands, but never again. I thought I would miss the Z9 more. I do a bit for some features, 4K, 120 frames per second, 20 frames per second in photo, but I am also okay with waiting for a camera that's just a bit better fit for me. This means in essence basically a potential Nikon Z8 or a Z7 third generation. Though Nikon, you have to deliver this year because I can understand if other people also get unpatient, I'm unpatient. And now to a lens that you all seem to be really interested in, the Nikkor 400 f4.5. This is basically a PF lens with a Z mount, really lightweight, 1.2 kilos, solid build and weather sealed. Build quality wise it is a pretty solid lens as you would expect for around 3.5 thousand euros or more. Rain and sealing was always an issue for distress for me when using the 200 to 500 which is not sealed. Besides the lens function button, we have two switches, autofocus to manual focus of course, and the focusing range, full or six meters to unlimited. The last one I had on on Dofferfjell without noticing, and that was really annoying. The memory reset button is on the other side and pressed by your right hand. Besides the focusing ring, we have another ring here that is also fully customizable. So far I have not found a real use for this one, but putting the aperture on it. But it is nice to have. The same goes for the lens's function buttons, here and here. This is really up to the person using it. I like to connect these with the focus memory. A feature that saves your focusing distance and calls it back when clicking the button assigned. Especially with the Z6, this has been a neat function because the Z6 has some back focusing issues. I could live with it and work around it. But as f4.5 becomes even more narrow than 5.6 and the lens does focus faster than the f-mount 200-500, this lens shows the weaknesses of Nikon's first generations even clearer. With the Nikon Z9, the focusing system and the lens work really good together as intended. But also here, the focus memory feature can be really useful. If you're filming one situation and you save the focus for another one where you know there's something gonna happen soon. For example, an eagle landing on a prey while you are filming in another direction. The pictures produced by the lens are sharp with a nice bokeh at f4.5. It might not be a 2.8, but it is lighter and it does not cost you a car or a kidney. On top it can easily be transformed into a super light 560mm f6.3 with a teleconverter. I use it obviously with the Mosque Oxen on Dovrefjell, but also to take some close-up portraits of the eagles here and there in between. As said, I'm not too convinced of cropping the sensor on top. 
Many of you might consider to getting a 100 to 400 instead of the 400 and I think that is also a nice choice from my point of view. But keep in mind that F4 lets in the doubled amount of light compared to F5.6. For myself I think sometimes the 100 to 400 would have been a better choice because I'm recording more video these days. While a zoom is the way to go for video and having the lens on a tripod, the 400 f4.5 might be the better photo option from my perspective. A fixed focal length will most probably always make you a better photographer because you have to just work this more creatively out. In short, price. This one is not as expensive as other pro lenses, but it's solid, it's sharp, and it gets you away with an affordable price comparably. The downside is it's not the fastest lens to be inside the forest in the evening. Wait, this is an absolute win because you can run around with this lens in your hand for hours without tiring. Especially if you have a smaller body on it for the Z50 that doesn't weigh anything. I mean what you directly lay notice to while you walk with this, this is not in my hands. It is though really hard in video to balance that lens out on a tripod, especially if you have a heavy camera like the Nikon Z9. Image quality. Very sharp and very beautiful photos and very nice bokeh at f4.5. Downside, it's not as creamy as a 2.8, but it is what you get at that point of a price. That was all I had for you today. I hope you enjoyed this real life review of the Nikon Z9 and the Nikkor 400 f4.5. If you want to see more videos like this, let me know down below. Thank you for watching. See you soon on the next one. Okay, came out from the forest, you can see it getting dark outside. It's January and the days are short, but we have some beautiful new snow. And these days I have a rather new companion. I borrowed a Nikon Z9 from a friend. Thank you, Christian, that I can just uh, try this out. Well, let's talk about the good things first. I can't say so much about the performance yet. You know, the numbers, uh, 20 frames per second in photo, um, 8K recording, which is really interesting for me, 120 frames per second, 4K, that's, that's the seller really for me uh, of this camera. And if you look at it, a lot of buttons everywhere to customize uh, everywhere, everything's full with buttons and uh, you can choose a lot of functionality. So that's really great about this camera. Uh, it seems really stable. Uh, I think you could hit a rock with this and the rock would break. So the body of the Z9, yeah, really sturdy thing, really a beast. But talking about a beast, it's a heavy beast. And you see that I have the 400 f 4.5 on here, really light lens, 1.1, 1.2 kilos. The, the body seems to be heavier. Um, so I'm really not sure, maybe ship shortage the last years, but definitely not stone brick shortage the last years. Um, it kind of makes this lens obsolete. I have some focusing issues on the Z6, like it focuses fast, but the problems of the back focusing on the Z6 become more obvious with this lens uh, because it, it focuses faster on the back. <laughs> but uh, with the new firmware update, we have memory set, which I have to try a bit more out on the Z6. But the Z9, yeah, even if I had the money, <laughs> let's say so this thing is expensive, I wouldn't buy this because this is not the camera for me. It certainly is a camera for a lot of people. If you're someone, uh, and that's just the first impression, but I th can already say that for me, if you're someone that goes on a lot of uh, planned tours where you don't walk so far, or if you do a lot of uh, height photography, this camera will probably be the thing for you in wildlife and nature photography. If you're someone like me that goes and wants to go even further into the national parks, drags a lot of gear with him, uh, attend and everything, because that's for me the feeling of wildlife photography. And this thing is not the right thing for you. And it's not the right thing for me. And I will not buy a Z9 
even if I get the money scrap together. I rather would like to have another model because with this lens, if I put the Z6 or Z50 on, I'm so happy, it doesn't weigh anything. I will have it always in my hand, the whole time. So I make more photos. This one I can't imagine having, having in my hand more than two hours uh, straight. This thing goes into the backpack, means less photos, which is not a seller for me at this point. It feels like yeah, a great camera, but it feels like I got a DSLR bag. It's really heavy and it drags me down. So it's not the right camera for me. Still, I'm looking forward to testing this one out in the comment days on Dorofiel, and then I can maybe tell you a bit more about the performance of this camera. It's a beast, but it's a heavy one. <laughs>